In this introduction to the discipline of sociology, Dr. Lori Peek overviews the focus, history, and approach of sociological inquiry. She defines sociology as the systematic study of society and the sociological perspective as one that analyzes patterns of individuals' experiences. She identifies several foundational thinkers, including Comte, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, and describes the major theoretical approaches that derive from them. She also focuses on methodological aspects of sociology, defining the scales at which sociologists work and the differences between quantitative and qualitative data gathering and analysis. She highlights some key sociological concepts, including structure and agency, social stratification, and inequality. She ends by discussing the future of sociology and highlights the move toward interdisciplinary work and new methodologies to address wicked problems. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to open this all up. And so we decided in our planning that we would launch this workshop with just a brief sort of 30 minute overview of what is sociology because that's the perspective that we're going to be focusing on for the next few days. So anyone who has ever uh, considered becoming a sociologist or who is a sociologist has had this question posed of them, whether it be from their parents as they're trying to decide whether they're going to become a sociology major or whether they're at a cocktail party. Somebody inevitably, once you say, hi, I'm Lori Peek and I'm a sociologist at Colorado State University, follows that statement with, what is sociology anyway? And if the sociologists in the room are anything like me, they oftentimes sort of stare vaguely out the window and kind of say something like, well, it's the study of human life, or maybe we'll say something like, it's the study of society, or something general like that. And that oftentimes leads people <laughs> to sort of either glaze over or to look quite confused. What does that, what do those kind of broad statements even mean? And so then we do what people oftentimes do when people look at us in a confused kind of way. We use more words because we think if we say more things, inevitably they're going to just sort of nod and smile and walk away and go get a drink. And so then sometimes we say things like this. We'll say, well, it's a systematic study of human behavior, social interaction social institutions and society. And so one of the challenges with starting any kind of lecture like this with defining what is sociology, what is our discipline, is that maybe um, it's hard to define it because sociology is almost everything. That when we talk about the study of society and of human life, there is almost no point in history, there's almost no space in our, around our globe, there's almost no group or community or, or type of organization of social life that sociologists have not considered in their work. And so the very breadth of what it is that we do makes defining what we do very difficult. Another thing that I would argue makes defining sociology somewhat difficult is that the bounds of what we do are not always so clear. And that has led some social scientists to argue that maybe a better definition of sociology might be that it's actually a perspective or an approach. And so Kai Erickson, who is one of our most distinguished sociologists and the son of Eric Erickson, the psychologist, says this. He says, the fact is that most sociologists regard their field as an approach rather than simply as a subject matter. It's a perspective rather than a clear body of knowledge. What differentiates us from other observers of the human scene is how we look out at the world. The way our eyes are focused, the way our intellectual reflexes are set, the way our imaginations are tuned. And so if we said something like that at said cocktail party, we would probably be followed on with, well then what is a sociological perspective? And so another way that um, I've heard Kai when he's trying to talk about what sociology is, the, well, another um, metaphor that he has used or analogy is that um, if you want to think about what is a sociological perspective, think about the following. So who was it in here who lives in New York? We have a couple of people who've lived in New York. So how many of you have been to New York ever? 
Okay, so most of us. So think about what your experience is walking along the streets of New York City, a big city, a diverse city, a cosmopolitan city. If all of us were walking together along the streets of New York City at street level, we would encounter a number of individuals. And we would see those individuals, we would see the contours and textures of their faces, the clothing they were wearing, the pace at which they were walking. And we might begin to make up things about those people. We might imagine that the man in the middle in the yellow shirt with the bag over his shoulder, he may be rushing along to work while the man slightly behind him holding the H&M bag, we may assume that he has a day off or maybe he's a tourist who's come to this city to shop. And so at that ground level, we see the biography and we see and we imagine things about individual stories and life histories. But what Kai says, if you want to understand a sociological perspective, what you might have to do is go to one of the many, many tall buildings that ring New York City and you would climb up. Maybe let's say we climbed up to the 14th floor. And then if we look down on that city, all of a sudden we would no longer see individual faces. We would no longer see the clothing or the contours of, of one's face. Instead, what we would begin to see are a series of patterns. And in fact, it might be astonishing, astonishing to us exactly how patterned something that moments before seemed chaotic and incredibly diverse. From the 14th floor, all of a sudden we'd start to realize the color of the cars and how frequently the color is yellow. We might start to see how patterned people are in terms of when they stop at a street corner and when they begin to walk and how they move and how they shift and so forth. And so that's one way of thinking about what do sociologists do. It's not that we're not interested in the individual perspectives and biographies, but much of what we're trying to do is to figure out these patterns and these conditions that help make society work or what are the patterns and conditions that are present when society doesn't function or doesn't work. Now, another way of thinking about the sociological perspective was put forth by one of our classic thinkers, C. Wright Mills, who he talked about the sociological perspective, or in his words, the imagination, as a vivid awareness of the relationship between personal experience and the brighter, broader or wider society in which individuals are embedded. In order to work on our sociological perspectives and to try to understand this influence, we're gonna to turn to a specific social issue or social problem that sociologists have spent a lot of time trying to understand from a lot of different perspectives. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about homelessness. And so I'd like all of you for just a moment, I would like you to consider the following question. And so I want you to take, um, let's just say, 35 seconds and I want you to brainstorm as many factors as you possibly can that would help explain why does a person become homeless? So to back to C. Wright Mills and how he teaches us about the sociological perspective. So one of the things that he and other sociologists oftentimes write about and recognize is that the United States on sort of, there are lots of scales that sociologists have developed to look at societies that range from highly individualistic societies to much more collectivist societies in terms of their orientation. And the United States, usually on almost any of those scales or measures, we fall very far on the individualistic side. That oftentimes when we see challenges or troubles or issues in people's lives, we oftentimes attribute those challenges or issues to matters of individual biography. And so what that sometimes translates into is that when we see an individual person on the street, a homeless person, we pass him or her by, that we might sort of start making a lot of assumptions that this person came from a broken home or this person is an addict or this person is mentally ill. And those things we know oftentimes are true, that the biggest drivers of homelessness in the United States include things like mental illness and things like lack of social ties and being from broken families and also um, addiction and so forth. And so sometimes we focus in on that individual actor. But what Mills asks 
us to also do in order to develop our sociological perspective is to also think about the history and the context in which that person is embedded as well as social structures and political structures and economic structures that may influence whether or not a person becomes homeless. And so in addition to a person's biography, we might want to think about in this context, what is the history of homelessness in the United States? When have there been other moments when homelessness has been at incredibly exceptionally high rates or when has it been at a lower rate? What's going on right now in the United States? We're living in a particular historical moment where child homelessness is at the highest rate that has ever been in our national history. And so all of a sudden you start putting this personal trouble into larger context. We also might try to start understanding our social, economic, and political structures to understand homelessness. So we might look at things like poverty level and try to connect how does the level of poverty in a given society as well as the availability of affordable housing, how do those aspects influence who may or may not become homeless as well as social and political policies. And then what Mills would say in order to have a fully developed sociological perspective that we must take all of these things into account, our biographies, our histories, and our social structures. And one of the things he said in his classic work was the following, when in a city of 100,000 only one man is unemployed, that is his personal trouble. And for its relief, we properly look to the character of the man, his skills, and his immediate opportunities. But when in a nation of 50 million employees, 15 million men are unemployed, that is an issue, and we may not hope to find its solution within the range of opportunities open to any one individual. And so this is something to the questions that were raised earlier this morning that we're going to continue, I think, throughout this in, entire workshop is that balance between agency or individual action and then broader social structures. Okay, and so now a few words on the history and emergence of our discipline. And so Auguste Comte oftentimes is credited as being the founder or founding father of sociology, largely because he was the first one to use the term. He was a French philosopher, and he was very, very concerned with taking and applying the methods in the natural sciences, many of the methods that many of you are all quite attuned to, taking those methods and then trying to apply them to the quote-unquote objective study of society. And much of Comte's work was focused on trying to identify social laws or things that he argued would hold across time and space. And in order to identify social laws, he argued that we needed to identify both what he called social statics or structures or institutions that remain in place. So these may be things like education, the healthcare institution, the family, religion, and so forth. So thinking about social statics and then also so thinking about social dynamics or how do those structures and institutions change across time and space. He was not incredibly successful at identifying social laws and in fact many people have sort of abandoned this idea that there are social laws that are akin to the laws that we might have in physics for example, but his work was obviously critical to the establishment of our discipline. Marx, Weber, and Durkheim are largely considered our big three founding fathers of sociology. When I was preparing for this talk, one of the questions that was raised during one of our meetings was sort of that question of, what are the things that if you are a capital S sociologist, that that's the badge that you get to wear around as if you're Superman or Superwoman. If, if you have that cape that you're wearing around, what are the things that all sociologists, if I meet Andrew, no matter where he's from in the world, no matter where he is trained, that there are certain assumptions that we may hold. And one of those assumptions is that if we're both capital S sociologists, that we at some point in our training have been exposed to these big three, that they are our foundational thinkers. And we're going to have an entire session led by Tom on these three thinkers following on to this. And so just briefly to give sort of an overview and why they're so important. And so Durkheim was a French sociologist, and he wrote um, several very, very influential empirical studies, including suicide, um, the division of labor and 
society and also the rules of the sociological method. And he is really associated with the functionalist tradition, which I'm gonna elaborate on that momentarily. And some of the things, and these are just some sort of highlights, takeaways, if there was a quiz after this, something you might associate with Durkheim is his idea of social facts, that he believed that there are pattern ways of acting, thinking, and feeling that exist outside of us as individuals and then exert control over us. And so he was very concerned with trying to identify sort of akin to Comte's laws, what are the social facts that exist in our society and influence us. He also was very concerned with identifying different forms of social solidarity, and so he wrote a lot about mechanical solidarity or more traditional societies where people might be considered very common in their values, beliefs, and in terms of their work that they carry out, as opposed to perhaps more advanced societies that were marked by what he referred to as organic solidarity or um, places that have very diverse divisions of labor. And he also wrote a lot about anomy or what happens when societies cease to have um, social control and what happens when we, our values come into conflict with one another. So Marx, who we already heard his name this morning and oftentimes sociologists get uh, affiliated with Karl Marx and his work for good or for bad. He was actually an economist and a philosopher and is largely associated with the conflict tradition within sociology. And um, unlike Durkheim, who was very, very concerned with the social order and the functioning of things, Marx believed that he wrote much more extensively about conflict over capital and how the bourgeoisie or the moneyed class and the working class might have conflict and that would ultimately lead to social change. And somewhat similar to Durkheim's concept of anomi, Marx wrote a lot about alienation or the feeling of powerlessness that emerges when individuals or groups are detached from the means and modes of production within society. Now, a uh, third great thinker or classic foundational thinker is Weber, who is a German social scientist. And he was very important in terms of bringing um, methods into sociology and, and bringing this emphasis that our work should be value free and should exclude our own personal values and biases and interests and instead should focus on the science of what we're doing. He also spent a lot of his work writing about bureaucracies and the roles that bureaucracies play in structuring society, but also the dangers of bureaucracy, bureaucracies when society becomes over-bureaucratized. So you've already heard um, the thinkers, Durkheim, Durkheim in particular is associated with the founding of this functionalist approach as is Comte. And so when we think about levels of analysis, where are we if we're climbing up to that 14th floor? <laughs> functionalists would be, think of it this way. So functionalists oftentimes see society almost like a bicycle wheel. And so they recognize that there are different parts of society that keep society moving forward and they're interested in the interconnection between those parts and how those parts operate together. Conflict theorists are also working at a macro level perspective in terms of their work, but they're much cons more concerned with trying to understand struggles over scarce resources, power and wealth inequalities, and how people may attempt to accumulate power or wealth and to hold on to that once they have it. They also look a lot at, at which groups benefit from which policies and practices in society. Now, a uh, fourth foundational thinker that is oftentimes included in discussions of the foundations of society is George Herbert Mead. And he was a philosopher, psychologist, and also a sociologist at the University of Chicago. And he um, brought a very different sort of perspective or way of looking to the sociological tradition. And so where, whereas Marx, Durkheim, and Weber were much more concerned with these large-scale structures and institutions, Mead was much, much more interested in understanding the more micro-level norms and values that influence our day-to-day -day lives and actions in society.
He's responsible for introducing notions of the generalized other, role taking, and the I and me. And I'm going to speak more in more depth later this afternoon during our theory session on symbolic interactionism, which is the micro level perspective with which Mead is most associated. But briefly, when we talk about the I, he brings, so to this question we had this morning again about agency and structure, what Mead brought into the discussion was that all of us have an I, that we can be spontaneous and creative and free thinking, but we also have a me, which is that other focused self, which allows us to understand the expectations and norms and values that are oftentimes placed upon us by others. And so what Mead brought into this, sort of when we think about major theoretical approaches or perspectives, this is the symbolic interactionist approach. And it's at a much more micro level that sees society as really being um, composed of the sum of the interactions, that it is people from the ground up who create society rather than society from the top down, just only encroaching on us as individuals. And so just sort of putting these different, how do we put the macro and micro paradigms in relation to one another? So some of the core questions that somebody working from a functionalist perspective might ask are, what are things like, what keeps society functioning or running? What are the different parts of society and how do they interconnect or relate to one another? What are the intended and unintended consequences of a policy or a practice or the manifest and latent consequences? A conflict theorist, on the other hand, may be much more interested, still again working at a macro level perspective, but trying to understand things like how wealth and power are distributed evenly or unevenly across the society, how um, people, once they have wealth and power, how they may try to hold on to or keep that wealth and power. Um, are there particular groups in society that are dominating or leading and how did they get ahead? How are society's limited resources divided among different groups? And then a much more micro level perspective, they may ask questions like how do people co-create society through their daily interactions, their words and their actions? How does social in interaction influence, create and sustain relationships? And do people change behavior from one setting to another? in terms of how they act towards other people, and if so, why. Now, somewhere between these very micro-level perspectives and the much more macro-level perspectives are what sociologists oftentimes refer to as meso or mid-range theoretical um, orientations. And these orientations oftentimes focus on things like organizations, institutions, laws, particular groups of people. And so, the sociologists oftentimes can and do focus on things like specifically the criminal justice system as a particular institution of interest, the healthcare system as a particular institution of interest, religion, the family, and so forth. And in fact, where sociology is at today in terms of the state of the discipline, and this may be a good point for discussion. So while sociology oftentimes gets characterized as either this very sort of micro level interactional, we're going out and observing people and taking notes, or we're these grand theorists sitting back in our offices, that many people would argue that today's sociologists for a variety of reasons, oftentimes fit much more in this sort of mid-level range where sociologists are oftentimes focusing on a particular institution or practice or group and sociologists can and do oftentimes spend their entire careers in that particular range. And so when we look at where is the state of the discipline today, this is from our American Sociological Association website from 2015. And right now in sociology, where we're also at as a discipline is we are incredibly diverse. And some people might argue that diversity has brought fracturing within our community. So we have 52 distinct sections or sub areas within sociology that people study. And what the numbers are here, this is the section membership. And so you can see that if we try to think about where are most sociologists working today, this isn't a perfect, uh, this isn't a perfect analysis of that, but it certainly is a proxy to say there are lots of sociologists who are working in the areas of sex and gender, culture, medical sociology, organizations, occupation and work, race, gender and class, and so forth. Now, something that is definitely um, 
that is skewed because of this. There are lots of areas where a lot of sociologists work like criminology and the criminal justice system, for example, tends to be the field within sociology where we have the most hires, but it's not accurately represented here because there's an entire society called the American Criminological Society or ACJS or something along those lines. And sorry if I just messed that up, but um, that is a whole other separate organization, but that's also a major area in sociology. And then you can see the much smaller sections over there that are oftentimes newer. Now, how do sociologists do what it is that they do? And so most basically, and Andrew's gonna talk to you about this shortly this morning, when we do our research, we tend to either do it using numbers, so we do quantitative research or we do qualitative research that's much more interpretive and looking at patterns and relationships. And so specific methods that social scientists and sociologists in particular oftentimes use include, we do surveys, and in my own work I've done online surveys, mail surveys, door-to-door -door surveys, and phone surveys. And so with each one of these methods, we oftentimes deploy them in very different ways, but survey research has long been a favorite of sociologists. We also increasingly do a lot of secondary data analysis using various data sets to try to answer very specific questions. Um, sociologists often do content analysis of everything from pictures that have been taken to children's storybooks to analyses of published print media. Social scientists oftentimes use field research methods as well, and so under the qualitative tradition, oftentimes doing in-depth interviews, engaging in participant observation, conducting focus groups, and even using newer and more creative methods like photo voice where you give a child or an adult a camera and ask them to go take a picture in response to a prompt. Also, sociologists sometimes use experimental work as well, doing everything from mailing out resumes to actually sending experimental researchers into the field to answer particular questions. And um, sociologists also are increasingly meeting with our geographer friends and using more and more spatial analysis as well as GIS in our work. And so one of the questions that, as I was preparing this talk that was posed was, how is sociology different or similar to the other social scientists and sciences that are out there? And even this morning, someone asked the question about the similarities or differences between sociology and anthropology. And so sociology is certainly on the spectrum and there is with, I would argue, with all of these social scientific traditions, there's oftentimes overlap in terms of the particular topics, questions, or concerns that we may have. And so concerns with labor market inequality, for example, concerns with discrimination in the labor market, concerns with things like religion or hazards or climate change, oftentimes could, these big topical areas could certainly fall into any one of these disciplines. And so in terms of what is the difference between a sociologist and a cultural anthropologist, for example? So as with most questions like this, the answer is gonna be, it depends. And so if you are a qualitative sociologist who engages in in-depth ethnographic work deeply embedded in your community and doing that kind of qualitative rich work that cultural anthropology is oftentimes known for, you may be reading just as much anthropology as you are sociology and you'll be borrowing methods, you will be borrowing ethical stances, you may be coming from a, a very, very similar epistemology in terms of how you approach your work. And so in that case, there may not be much difference at all between that particular sociologist and a cultural anthropologist. But then because sociology is so diverse in terms of the questions posed, the methods used and so forth, you would meet another sociologist, including many sitting in this room, who would have nothing in common with that cultural anthropologist or very little in common with them. And so I think when that overlap occurs, it occurs not just in the sort of topical interest space, but sometimes it's in the sharing of methods and so forth. And I hope this is something we can follow on a lot more with the discussion over the next couple of days. Okay, and finally, just to wrap up a few 
things. And again, this came up in the questioning this morning. So a big and enduring day, a debate that every graduate student in sociology has at some point during their graduate seminars is this question and debate around structure versus agency. And so this really ex highlights this ongoing and, and long-term tension within sociology of trying to understand how much of an individual's life is indeed determined by social forces and factors that surround us. And so people coming from the more agentic perspective might argue that individuals, we are rational beings who have the ability to take in information to change our minds, to change our behavior, and to ultimately change our life worlds. That we have the ability to think, to verbalize, and ultimately to act that is independent of whatever structures may be impinging upon us. Now, the people on the more structural <laughs> side would argue that we are all born into a particular historical moment. We're all born into a particular cultural and social and political and economic context that whether we like it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, these pre-existing social arrangements, everything from the families we're born into to the societies that we live in shape and ultimately will constrain our behavior to some extent. And so the structure agency Debate, debate is something that is ongoing and is oftentimes um, at the center of things that we talk about as sociologists. Also, another contribution of sociology, somewhere where a lot of us have attuned and focused our lenses is on this issue of social stratification. And so this is referring to the hierarchical arrangement of social groups based on their control or power over basic resources. And those resources may range from natural resources to economic resources to interpersonal or social resources, who has access to what in their day-to-day -day life in terms of knowledge and information and so forth. And so when sociologists look at social stratification, much of our analysis is centered around, it's hard to get a lot of sociology published if you don't take into account what are the class, gender, race, age and so forth differences in what it is that you're looking at. And just finally, a few thoughts. And again, I hope that um, this is something we'll be talking about and debating over the coming days. Where are we at sort of in terms of the present and future of sociology? And so in 1967, Churchman published a, a really seminal article on this idea of wicked problems. And one thing that I think is happening with sociology as a discipline is that we have long focused on wicked problems or problems that are complex, they're changing, they're hard to grasp, and they're highly contested. And so when you read about wicked problems in today's debates, they oftentimes are centered on climate change, hazards, the ongoing HIV pandemic in certain parts of the world, other public health crises, and so forth. And these are all challenges and issues that sociologists have long been attuned to. And related to this, because wicked problems are, by their very definition, complex. They are not centered in particular disciplinary or geographic boundaries. Increasingly, sociologists, for a variety of reasons, including funding reasons, as well as other, other drivers, are doing more and more multi and interdisciplinary work. Also, sociologists are engaging in more sophisticated methodological approaches, and as more and more quote unquote, big data or publicly available data sets are available. Sociologists are shifting the focus of some of the questions they ask while still maintaining that long tradition of a more micro level analysis. And simultaneously, we know there are many um, public, political, and funding threats to the credibility and legitimacy of the social sciences that are occurring right now. And so at the same time that sociology may be expanding in its focus, it's also more and more being expected to defend those blurry boundaries that oftentimes make up our very discipline. And so with that, I think we're definitely at time and thank you for listening.